Humans are good at making things. We make buildings, cars, gadgets, clothes, gigantic particle colliders, tiny robots, whatever these are. Want a computer that goes on your head and makes you look silly? We can make it. But here's the thing, we're actually not the world's best engineers. Nature is. I mean, just look at this gorgeous specimen. Or this one. Or this one. Humans have always been limited by our materials. The things we could extract or refine. While nature has had the building blocks of life to play with. We didn't even really know what DNA looked like until the 1950s, let alone how it worked. But it's 2015. We now know how to read, write, cut, paste, and thus design DNA to make living things do what we want them to do. In short, we've entered the age of synthetic biology. There's no official definition of synthetic biology, but here's an unofficial one. Synthetic biology refers to both the design and fabrication of biological components and systems that do not exist in the natural world, and the redesign and fabrication of existing biological systems. What does that mean exactly? Well, it means we can engineer E. coli to pump out the anti-malarial drug artemisinin. We can make sterile mosquitoes. We can program microbes to make perfume and biofuels. We can make plants that glow and flowers that change color. And scientists have done all this just in the past 20 years. The technology has become so mainstream that every year hundreds of high school, college, and graduate students compete in an international synthetic biology competition called iGEM. Last year, one of the winners designed a microbe to detect and kill the evil fungus that's been destroying the world's banana supply. They didn't actually build the microbe. That would take way longer than the six months they had for the competition. But they did manage to get part of the way there. iGEM teams design their creations using biobricks. They're kind of like the Legos of biology. Functional bits of DNA that people can mix and match as needed. There are more than 20,000 biobricks currently cataloged, and that number grows every year. In fact, everything about this industry seems to grow every year. The cost of DNA sequencing and synthesis is plummeting. The availability of commercial biotech equipment is on the rise. And synthetic biology enthusiasts say this is just the beginning. Could we one day make trees that grow plastic fruit? Could we bring animals back from extinction? Could we engineer entirely new organisms? In theory, these are all possible. But here's the big, genetically engineered elephant in the room. We could also, in theory, build a deadly virus. Or release something into the wild that wasn't supposed to be there. Or instigate a new age of bioterrorism. So synthetic biology can either be really, really cool or really, really scary. And people tend to fixate on those two extremes. Drew Endy, a synthetic biologist at Stanford University, calls this the half-pipe of doom. Back in the early 2000s, when everyone was freaked out about anthrax, government officials swayed toward the really, really scared side of the halfpipe, and they let biohackers know it by arresting some of them. Scientist, author, and self-proclaimed garage biohacker Rob Carlson says that a lot of home biologists went dark around this time, Yo. and some are still operating in secret. So prohibition isn't effective. But then again, we already knew that. We advocate the repeal of the 18th Amendment. In 2010, President Obama's Bioethics Commission issued a report on synthetic biology, acknowledging that the DIY bio community actually played an important role in the field, and that neither prohibition nor complete freedom were a good idea. And earlier this year, the administration asked the EPA, FDA, and USDA to take a fresh look at biotech regulations. But that'll take a while, so stay tuned. Whatever happens, and wherever you fall in the half-pipe of doom, synthetic biology is happening. The question is, how will we use it? Yo.